Hello. Hello. Why does my stream say waiting for me? Oh my god, it takes so long for this stuff to fix. Should be live now. <clears throat> Hello everyone. Uh, you seem to be keep manifesting hot dogs into existence. You see, the trick is that earlier today I went to the shop and I bought a lot of them. I bought like 10. <laughs> I got four more. I got four more. I've been eating hot dogs all day while I finish the, um, the Armored Core 6 video. Um... I, I'm expecting you to suddenly go, I made more hot dogs. <laughs> I might make more hot dogs later, you know? Hello, them from uh, Primark Logarius. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, you had to refresh to get me loaded. See, YouTube. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, can't stop playing Breath of the Wild, so you'll be passive on this one. Put the game down, my, 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 my friend. I need all of your energy. <laughs> nah, it's fine. It's fine. This is a good sort of passive listening content, you know? What's the plan? The plan is I've been scouring the internet for the good Joss Sawyer Pillars of Eternity um, convention talk. It's the one where he talks about all of these eclectic esoteric ideas they came up with for it's uh, Pillars of Eternity 2. These ideas they came up with for trying to bring something new to the table with this. Stuff like the, the I think it's the rumor or the topic mechanic, for example. And he's sort of just talking about that. What worked and what didn't work and stuff like that. I think, uh, uh, I just finished Baldur's Gate 3. Oh my god, Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, what about the banter? Yeah, Adak, what about the banter? I was gonna. Uh, I was going to play sussy virtual novels, but then I remembered the stream. You cannot listen. Listen, you cannot be playing horny things while you listen to my voice, because the association will make it hard for anybody to ever watch my videos again. Please. Uh, but yeah, tiddling. You mean? Did I say? What did I say? Anyways, 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 anyways. Let's get started. Also. This is not GDC, this is Digital Dragons. They might be more litigious, so I don't know if this stream is going to stay up. They might uh, try to copyright me. In which case, I'm not going to fight it. <laughs> I've given up on fighting those. <laughs> and as always, let me know about audio. If it's too loud, if it's not loud enough, let me know. Ah, drinking some coffee. Enough with these animatics! We've waited long enough! Okay, so this is from 2019. Oh my god. RPG Evolution and... Alright, uh, so I gave this a very fancy title. Breaking the Mold, RPG Evolution and Paradigm Shifts in Pillars of Eternity 2, Deadfire. Oh. Uh, really what they should be called is... So, they cut out the name for the video, as you can see. <laughs> they made it Breaking the Mold, RPG Evolution and nothing more. And for the thumbnail, I thought this was the name, so I like bracketed it specifically and tried to make it look nice. But <laughs> what was it supposed to be called, man? We tried to do some new things in role-playing games. Some of them worked, and a bunch of them didn't. Let's find yeah, out. Yeah. Uh, All right. What in the heck is this talk about? Uh, this is ultimately it's a post-mortem for Pillars of Eternity 2: Deadfire. Awesome. It's about looking at the assumptions that we made going into the sequel and what proved right about those assumptions and what proved ultimately be very wrong. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, Deadfire ASMR is the voice as always. Oh, yeah. These are both crowdfunding games uh, that Obsidian Entertainment made. There are Sexy four Vampire four Acer. Days, isometric role playing games. Is that the new thing? Dragon, or, uh, uh, Icewind Dale, Baldur's Gate, and Planescape <laughs> Vampire uh, Fanboy Viking. Style, character development system, so you advance over several levels. With I don't classes, know about that. We use 2D backgrounds with 3D characters. We've been over this chat. And they were both made in Unity uh, with our own I'm too tools, for game data stacked. I'm too built to be a fanboy. My shoulders are too wide. The feedback that we received on Pillars of Eternity, because the feedback that we received proved to be the foundation for our expectations for the sequel. Some of that you can't be a femboy with the traps data. like these. I'm doing a flex. On that feedback and the reasons for doing so, and how we made those changes. I'm going to talk a little bit about the backer beta, which was fairly short, the launch itself, and what happened after the launch. I'm going to go into some controversial features that we approached during development. Some of these were controversial within the team. Most of them were controversial in the community, um, but all of them are worth talking about, I think, um, for, for the benefit of development. <sighs> And also long-term post-launch support. Uh, last week, my brother, you know, you're, he's, the one-year anniversary. Of I don't get why. Um, this must be like a prerequisite for when they tell you this is how you do one of these talks. But like, you don't, you don't need to do this much. You can just say, "What will we be covering?" We'll talk about feedback. We'll talk about some changes we made. We'll talk about like you don't need to explain all of this. Is it self-explanatory? Plus, you're going to explain it again later. 
I say, even though I do this in my videos too. Patch. Uh, Obsidian has become very dedicated to doing long-term support for its titles, especially Pillars of Eternity. So we did a lot of post-launch patching and DLCs, and that made a big difference in the long run. A little note here. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about decisions that I made that I'm completely responsible for. There are other decisions that were made above my head. Um, it might sound like I'm trying I'm going to raise bus. the volume a little bit. bit. But in order to actually Apparently do a post-mortem on this and really talk about the decisions that were made and why, um, I felt the need to sometimes refer to decisions that were made above my head. Let me know if this screwed up the audio. Process. For those of you who do not know who I am, <clears throat> I'm Josh Sawyer. I'm the studio design director at Obsidian. I started at Black Isle Studios in 1999. I worked there until 2003. I worked on primarily the Icewind Dale series of games, which is... I'm more interested in watching the person prancing around with a camera. Oh, yeah, that guy. It's one of the inspiration points for Pillars of Eternity and Deadfire. That guy. Between 2003 and 2005, I was at Midway San Diego working on a gauntlet game. That did not go the last well. stream where Acer criticized himself for um, things he was going to keep doing anyways. Of course. <laughs> What are you talking about? Of course. I'm not going to change. I'm too old to change. My brain, I don't have the brain plasticity of youth anymore. I'm like, I'm like a senior citizen at this point. So I can't change. I'm not going to change. Looks like a high school project PowerPoint. They always do, don't they? If I, you know, heaven forbid, if these people ever get tricked into letting me do one of these talks... It would be the most amazingly expertly presented talk of all time. It would be a crazy talk. It would not make any sense and it would be terrible. But like, I would call up Theomeny, maybe, or a uh, Casative, and I would ask her, hey, hey, hey girl, what up? And I would basically beg her to do nice PowerPoint presentations because she's like an Excel genius. So she's probably a PowerPoint genius too. Um, and now for the past few years, the studio design director. Currently, Are you even 30, Acer? Not yet. I'm between directing projects, I'm helping on supporting internal teams. As Not yet. Director, and I'm also working but it's it's rapidly approaching. On the Pillars of Eternity tabletop role-playing game. I did not expect that I would actually ever get a chance to work on a tabletop role-playing game professionally. But <laughs> no, man, great. So, I'm going to talk about some assumptions that we had going into the sequel. That's hey, Kim Lee. There, by the way. Uh, we are in a space with Divinity Original Sin 2, kind of. Uh, Sven from Larian. He's a very great guy. He's a very forthcoming person with any data that he has about... Well, I thought you were almost mid-30s. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm in my 20s. ...about the success of Divinity, Original Sin, and Original Sin 2. And one of the things that came up when we were talking with him is he had mentioned that there was actually... If I, if I was in my mid-30s, you'd think, you'd think I, uh, I, I treat my food better, right? Have you, you've, you've seen my uh, delicious chat. You know, you know how I cook. This is not how a 30-year-old man cooks. ...relatively low overlap between the audiences for Original Sin and Pillars of Eternity, which we thought was kind of interesting. But then again, they are fundamentally different games from a combat perspective, which is a big deal to a lot of people. Divinity games are turn-based. Pillars of Eternity is real-time with pause because that's what the Infinity Engine games were. Uh, Divinity, Original Sin, to, Divinity, Original Sin 2. It's true sure because sometimes you have some very boomery takes. Well, you know, the baby boomers, the greatest generation. <laughs> now, what are you talking about boomery takes? This is quite offensive to me. We're off... We've unfortunately seen it. My delicious chat is a gem. It is a gift to the internet. Everybody who is watching this in the future and doesn't know what we're talking about, it's a, it's a, it's a channel in the Discord. You have to join. We're not going to explain it here. The second game incredibly well. I'm so just special well. because I have so we boomer like, well, takes. We well. so <laughs> How dare you, people? The of the game. Call me up over. You even better and sell incredibly well. Uh, wow wrong that did not happen but it worked out pretty well anyway so now we're going to talk about how we looked at these criticisms and tried to move forward one of the first criticisms by the way when i when i talk about these criticisms i'm only listing the ones that really seem to come up a lot in user reviews and um in professional reviews there are many many other complaints that are totally valid that people could make about these games um, but these are the ones that kept coming up and we thought it was very important to try to address them one okay. of the first is that combat was hard to follow again Pillars of Eternity was a real-time with pause game. Um, when Baldur's Gate came out, it was kind of revolutionary that it used real-time with pause for RPG combat. For most people, it was the first game they had seen that used a system like that. RTSs were very popular in the late 90s, early 2000s. Not very popular right now. So, Okay. Um, do we want to spend a couple of seconds talking about uh, hard-to-follow combat? Because... Uh, I, I think the... I, I think I've talked about this with probably every RTS uh, GDC talk and such what we've done together, I think I've noted this every single time, is that I'm not a fan of these games. I just think that because they are so far removed from the mainstream right now, 
whenever you send a developer into these mines, they're going to come out with a lot of interesting takes and a lot of little gold nuggets about how to make video games because this forces you to really put on your thinking cap. And stuff like this, 20 years ago, you you released this, it's the best game ever. Um, but yeah, now we'd, we'd released this and the general audience is like, I can't follow this. What's going on here? There's just a bunch of flashing lights. Um, and... I, I, I get it because when I whenever I play these games, I'm never that intrigued by the combat. I think I noted this last time, but I really like um, my favorite thing to do in these games. And this is such a this is such a normy thing. I'm I'm sorry, chat preemptively. I love walking around and you know emptying out the fog of war, just like getting to see the all of the world and all that stuff. That's what interests me. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. It is kind of difficult to do combat, I guess, in this perspective, especially since you need the animations to be big enough to sort of convey the happenings, but because of the camera angle, you also need it to be sort of flat enough. Well, not flat. You can't... See, it's 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 funny because on one hand, because you have a fixed camera angle, you can sort of lock in that the player is going to be seeing the conflict from a pers specific perspective, and so you can animate it from that perspective, and it gives you a lot of control over the camera like that. But because there's so much stuff happening, and because it all has to be sort of independent of the environment, because this effect probably plays everywhere, um, I don't know. I don't. I don't. Uh... See, I I don't think this should necessarily be a problem. I think this is something that should be... You could probably solve this with just, like, a grid layout where, um, you know, when, a com when combat begins, like, everybody has formation, but you put it on, like, a hexagonal grid that's invisible, and it sort of locates everyone, and it tries... And, like, the system tries its hardest to separate people so that you can keep a very clear line of sight on the combat, and then you can also integrate positioning into the combat or something. I don't know. Um, not a big fan of this. Uh, the big problem with Pillars of Eternity I keep seeing is that it's just following tradition because it's tradition. I did think there was a lot of that. Um, I think there was a lot... See, uh, when I played Pillars of Eternity, uh, for that video that didn't happen, all of the stuff I thought was super interesting was the new stuff. And all the things that I didn't so much love, I later learned was like, oh yeah, this is something D&D &D did forever. <laughs> um... Uh, so far removed from the mainstream right now, Baldur's Gate 3 just came out. Y you know what I mean. Like, nobody, like, even the developers um, of Baldur's Gate, they were like, yeah, we didn't expect this to do so well. Also, this came out in 2019. Um, there should be options to turn animations off. <gasps> uh, the characters and attacks have full 360-degree movement, so they'd still need all the same animations as an unlocked camera. Um, sure, I'm more talking about, like, the effect, so, like, if you throw down fire, uh, provided, I'm not, I don't 100% remember if you can move the camera in Pillars of Eternity, but assuming you can't, um, you could just draw the fire effect from one angle and it would work, right? However, wherever the character casts the fire, you're only looking at the fire from one angle. So when Pillars of Eternity came out, um, obviously all the veterans of those games adapted fairly quickly, but there were a lot of people that had no experience with this type of game. The pace of the combat was very fast, and there were a lot of problems that we tried to address. One of the things that we approached was how we rendered visual effects. As you can see from the big mass of color in the middle of the screen, that's a couple of spells going off. What's going on under there? Who knows? Um, that was an experience that a lot of people had playing Pillars of Eternity. Where they but also, out. also, um, because this is role playing, like this is a very sort of hard transition from tabletop to CRPG system here, where the combat is really just tuned around. Um, flipping variables to deal status ailments and trying to get big numbers to activate rather than a more interesting and truer truer to form role-playing combat system of your creating conditions so rather than a bunch of flashing lights going on and numbers appearing on screen and dice rolling you'd be like well you know my enemy's standing in a bush so you'd pause the game and you'd open up your you know arcana magica or whatever and you'd find, like, oh, I have this spell here that lets me control nature. I'm going to cast that spell on the bush, and then the bush is going to do damage to the enemy. 
or like this enemy standing in mud. I'm gonna cast rain to create like a to create like a, 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 a he's standing on dirt. I'm gonna create mud uh, with rain, like sort of more immersive sim chemistry systems that you could sort of toy around with with using the magics. Um, yeah. It would go off and then it it's hard it's probably something. way harder to concept to create something like well not not necessarily though but you know you'd probably just have to map it out much much harder and you'd have to integrate all of that stuff into the world design but you could probably bracket it all off progression wise the same way you do traditional magics so like um Obviously, if you have grass all over the overworld, then any any spell that lets you interact with nature or use nature to interact with the enemies, that's a really powerful spell. But you obviously wouldn't unlock the powerful spells right away. You'd unlock, like, a, a, a grass, a tall leaf of grass sprouts up and slash, slaps your enemy or slashes them or something like that. ...in there, but I don't know. So we actually changed our rendering pipeline to reduce that visual noise. I thought you said they were standing on a turret. <laughs> yeah, if you see a dog walking by, you can cast a spell on the dog, and the dog will will pee on somebody. <laughs> that tanks can use to lock people down. Um, it proved to be very noisy in the original game. You've had a lot of UI feedback that was really confusing to a lot of people. So we made changes to how engagement worked to just reduce that overall clutter. It Tyranny was a good Obsidian CRPG with the type of magic system you'd want. The most controversial thing Too bad it's unfinished. Oof. This was one of the more criticized things in the Oof. game. Um, but yeah, I, I, I might check that out. That sounds interesting. Games, and that felt very traditional to a lot of people. Moving to five characters just irritated a lot of people. But ultimately, it was an important change for us to make to help make the combat easier to follow. And yeah, and see, this is, this is something that... Because they are purists, there's a lot of traditionalist purists in the studio. This is something that I really disagree with them about. Where... Well, not, not the conclusion they made, but they're talking about like, well, well, people wanted X many characters and we had to make a change and we had to debate it amongst ourselves. And, and like, you never, ever, 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 ever need to do something just because it's tradition if there's a better way. Especially like when you're doing this sort of game design stuff, obviously you don't follow traditions that make the game worse. You You just do the thing that makes the game better. And if having just five characters in a party is easier than having six characters, whether it's interactions, whether it's just, I don't know, whether it's rendering, I don't know what the problem specifically is. Maybe it's something under the hood. Um, you do that. You don't you don't bloat out things just to sort of keep true to conventions. That's ridiculous. Although I do hear that Baldur's Gate 3, they've, I, I hear that there's a mod for it that lets you, that removes the follower, uh, the follower cap. And that when you play the game that way, it, it doesn't work because combat takes way too long. But aside from that, the story actually manages to play out. Um, which, if that's true, I think that's really interesting that it's coded that way. The customization system really added a lot both for players. It allowed them to build their own custom AI sets, but it also allowed us... To it's not an, oh, it's very buggy unfinished. It's more of an, I wish it was had an actual ending finished. Unfinished. Okay, okay. AI behavior and that helped a great deal. This is just a contrast right here. This is a, a typical battle. Actually, that's not a typical battle. That's a big battle from Pillars. And here is a battle from Deadfire. The visual effects rendering changes made a big difference. There's a lot of visual clutter that's gone from engagement and things like that. It did help a lot. Yeah. Another criticism is that the Stronghold felt very disconnected from the main story. I think that was a totally fair criticism. Uh, we included Stronghold because people like Strongholds, and it turned out we didn't have the resources to really integrate them as well as we wanted to. So we decided to make the Stronghold a ship. This was something that we argued about for quite a while. At first, we thought about doing multiple little Strongholds all around the archipelago. Ultimately, it seemed like it made more sense to just say, look, you're going to have to travel by ship around the game. Let's just make that your Stronghold. Uh, it's necessary for traveling, so you're going to keep going back there. It's a convenient place for all of your companions and other little... This, on paper, seems like a really good idea. ...NPC buddies together, so that if you want to swap party members out, you're always going to wind up going back to the ship at various points. Um, and it's very appropriate for a pseudo Age of Sail game. Pillars of Eternity is not... It's really not a medieval game. It's more supposed to be a, a, an early modern game, uh, 16th century plus. And so going into the Age of Sail felt like a natural progression from the original game, which was early 16th century. Another big criticism is that the stronghold mechanics are boring. Also, can't argue with that. Uh, they weren't that interesting. Um, so we added a ship crew and navigation mechanics. That was relatively straightforward. Um, the crew was an easy place to put NPCs that you found. Um, for example, if you had a quest that ended... I don't know about this. I don't personally feel like... Because I kind of liked the stronghold in the first Pillars of Eternity, even though it wasn't like the deepest thing in the world. And I, I would have much preferred if they'd have... You know, if you're going to... I think I said this last time too. If you're going to integrate it, make that the point. Um, but... I don't know. Maybe you... I don't know. I don't know. 
and then you see him like join your crew as a reward that's like I I don't I don't have anywhere to go with this I just don't I don't I just I don't think that just because you have the stronghold you don't know it doesn't need to be like a gigantic thing you don't need to have mechanics tied to it 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 can just be a way to travel the world um but I feel like if you integrate it at all like if you if you if you do anything more than just having it there if you try to add anything to it it needs to be good you can't ha because otherwise you kind of just like the problem with the stronghold in the first game was that they're kind of it's there but it's not exceptional it's not it doesn't really do anything it's like they it it goes ha it goes halfway and it's it's it pleases nobody Again, one of the more controversial things that we added. And I feel like with the ship, like, uh, you can just have the ship and uh, don't do anything more, and that probably would have been fine. But if you're going to uh, add stuff to it, and it's very expensive, and it's you know, very actually add a lot to it. So we have partial VO for some characters. Almost none of the characters in the game actually have full voiceover. You all know my opinion on voice acting, so... Um, Let's just let him talk. Liked by a lot of people. Um, only the chapter breaks were even narrated, so any of the prose text that we wrote was just plain text that you had to read. Streamers, which were starting to become very prominent in about 2015 when this game came out, they really, really hated seeing a lot of unvoiced text. Wow! Why? Streamers! Once again, the damn um, streamers. Of streaming the game um, just kind of frustrated people. Uh, Probably because they felt the need to read it all out, I guess. I, you know what, for a streaming session, I guess that's fair. Um, but then, see, so you're kind of chasing the market, you know? Like, maybe these games aren't the best for streaming. In the middle of Deadfire's development, Divinity Original Sin 2 came out, and it had full VO for everything. So that set a new standard. I hate them for it. They did that, though, and we had to respond to it. We couldn't ignore it. Um, yes, you could have. You could have. The, the 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 consumer would have disagreed, but you could have ignored it. God, do not cater to streamers. <laughs> and you know the the problem is that you know he's talking about it here. It's like, well, you know, Divinity Original Sin did it, so now we have to do it too, and it's just a nightmare. Like you're allocating a lot of money into into budgeting for this. You know, your budget. You're not allocating a lot of money to, to budgeting for this. You're, you're budgeting money for this. You're putting aside a lot of time, and you have to sort of schedule it in and. Now, because you've committed to narrating everything uh, and VOing everything, you actually need to be very conscious of your text economy. You can't have too much text. You can, like when you when it's when it's not narrated, you can change text around last minute, like two seconds before release. You can just change the text, and it's fine. But when you VO everything, it sort of locks you more deeper into this and. This is that's kind of one example of now because you're listening to streamers, uh, not not that not that that's not a valid perspective to take, um, but because you've decided to listen to them, you have locked yourself much deeper into the story, and it's going to be much harder to make changes when you want to make them. So um, I guess like everything else, this is not really a problem if you just pre-plan well enough. But you never pre-plan well enough. There's something going to come out partially my fault, actually largely my fault. Um, there were, does, does everyone know what a trash fight is? It's a fight in a role-playing game where basically it, it just feels like it doesn't offer anything tactically or strategically that's different from the fights around it. It feels like a waste of the player's time. Uh, Bioware didn't exist uh, so and hadn't done that since like, Kodor 1. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I feel like Kotor 1 though is kind of, you can kind of feel in the Kotor games what I'm talking about because if you play KOTOR 2 or KOTOR 1, well, let's take KOTOR 1. If you play KOTOR 1 and then play Planescape Torment, Planescape Torment has vastly more text. And that's probably because they weren't constrained with a small, like, a locked-in VO budget. So Chris Avalon could uh, just go wild. So that blockouts that people did for their levels had to include encounter maps so we could see where the encounters would be. Documents also had to define those encounters. So for example, if someone said, well, I only have three encounters in this level, and then we found out that they're all essentially the same encounter, I'd say, like, cut one of those encounters or change it or change both of those encounters into something else. Um, but a lot more work went into the upfront design of saying, please don't flood every level of trash fights because the players, they just don't enjoy it. 
and then encounters the system design path. So we have area designers. Area designers uh, know the systems of the game to a certain extent, but the fine tuning of combat was more on the system design side. So the idea was when an area designer would put an encounter in a level, then we would later have a system designer go through and they would do a pass on tuning that. Um, unfortunately, there was so much system design work to do that only a small number of encounters received that tuning pass prior to launch, and that turned out to bite us in the ass because the game wasn't tuned very well. Mm. Mm. The environments felt too static. Again, this game was a 2D game with 3D characters. In Pillars of Eternity, none of the vegetation was dynamic. Um, there wasn't dynamic cloth, really, except around the characters. The lighting felt a little stilted and off in the shadows, and the characters didn't integrate into the background. It got what I would call the Scooby-Doo effect, where you can see the, the moving characters that feel very separate from everything else in the scene. Um, we approached this in a couple of ways. Some of it was graphical and some of it was behavioral. So we added a new NPC scheduling and behavior system. This allowed characters to sort of have their own lives and routines. It made the environments feel more alive because instead of characters just sort of standing in one place all day long, they had their own routines that they would go through. Yeah, this, is, this is all fine. Cities and things like that, but it was also used for monsters and patrols. And then we did a lot of rendering work. Um, to get <laughs> uh, if you're going to compare, consider Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 versus KOTOR 1 and Dragon Age Origins. Then play Scaling versus Torment 2, Shared Riders. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's that's probably more fair. But I'm more I'm more just talking about the uh, amount of of text. It's funny because like, I I think I really need to start playing uh, Dragon Age Origins. Everybody always brings up Dragon Age Origins and everything. It might be one of the only sort of great games that I've never played. Once the game got to this point, it's, it kind of just looks like a 3D game now that just has an isometric camera. But that background is actually all 2D, but it has 3D lighting integrated into the 3D you know characters and everything like that. Um, so we moved to physically based rendering. We moved from Unity 4 to Unity 5. It seemed like a no-brainer to go to physically based rendering and start oh. using um, various tools to just oh to Unity. Uh, we introduced the <laughs> physics. Uh, all the trees there in the background, those are all dynamic and they blow with the wind the wind was a dynamic element that would move cloth and vegetation it, it added a ton just another um, showcase of bad pre-planning to unifying the character shadows <laughs> and lighting into the world so that when shadow when characters moved through darkness they really felt like they were integrated into the environment instead of being separate from them we added parallax layers excuse me we added parallax layers um parallax layers obviously this is very old technology going back to like 8-bit games even earlier where you have a scrolling layer in the background or multiple scrolling layers that move at it's a bioware layers. game how great could it be you ooh, you, ooh, you know bioware used to be pretty good back in the day this is kind of blasphemous of you rendering stuff but it did add a lot in the areas that we use it and then we had a new water technology the water in pillars one was basic and functional we uh licensed a water technology called cedo and then we altered it pretty significantly it made the oceans look really beautiful so that when you're on the coast or on a ship which is a lot of the places in the game the water really looked great yeah so this is a criticism of both games um we did our best to try to reduce them but it was a very difficult challenge load times were very bad this was especially difficult in areas where you were going in and out of buildings over and over um we switched to a hub-based loading system. So, for example, in a city or any area that had a large interior with several interiors... Jade Empire would, 2, uh, never ever. Child areas and you know, I also just realized that uh, Sinclair Lore is going to be uh, premiering a video in 18 minutes. I, would it be funny if we took a break from this and I just streamed me <laughs> talking over their premiere <laughs> for like an hour and then we go back here? transitions in big areas a lot easier. Um, there was a ton of memory that was being taken up and a ton of loading that was happening with Unity data. All of our gameplay data, all of our spells, all of our creatures were in Unity asset bundles. And we would load those dynamically every time we would load into an area. That was very time-consuming and expensive. So we moved all of that out of the uh, Unity editor into our own standalone editor that was using XML or JSON. Uh, so it's text. All that stuff would load at the start of the game, and that, that helped eliminate a lot of the load uh, time as well. And then finally, the save load system was rewritten. This might not seem like that big of a deal, but... Um, when we rewrote the save load system, we also reauthored how this, the save game state was restored. So the first time you'd enter the game, or if you loaded a save game, um, it would Oof. get you into the game much more quickly because it wasn't trying to reset all these variables and do all this crazy stuff. So I actually have a bit of a history with uh, JSON strings. Um, because when I was integrating a save function into Snails of Skeletons, I originally planned to do it with JSON. And after a bit of experimentation, I decided that no, ultimately, using an ini file was better. But then I needed to sort of mask the menu because um, you're not really loading a game. If you pl if you press, like, load game, you're not actually loading the game because the game is already loaded. These are already, like, what the functions are. Um, so when you're loading a game, uh, you're actually just playing the game as normal and uh, new gaming it is the only one that actually affects it. So you have to create a sort of smoke screen of a menu, main menu, and it's, it's just, it's just, uh, it's just funny. Companion reactivity was bad. Um, I think people liked our companions overall, but there was a lot of play. There were a lot of places. Where I tried to figure out Jason and almost immediately gave up. Uh, yeah, um, you know, if you're if if I was working on a Pillars of Eternity. I think Jason would probably be better than any, but 
if if you're ju- if you're making like a solo game, if you're making a small thing, you, know, you don't you do not need a JSON. That's I feel it. It's not it's not offering enough. At, at least to the project I was working up, I didn't feel like it was worth learning how to work those, uh, considering how little I was really asking them to do. Our companions either wouldn't react to each other, NPCs wouldn't react to them, they wouldn't leave the And it's, it's you know, it's probably super simple, but I just really didn't have time to study it. <laughs> uh, because Obsidian is known for writing, this is something that we thought was very important to address. So right away, we had more in-depth budgeting for writing. What I mean by this is that all the writers sat down and we said, okay, how big are companions going to be? How are we going to break up the writing responsibilities in terms of their hubs, which is their main question node, uh, their interjections and conversations, their banters with each other, the relationships you can have with them, their personal quests. So we broke those down into ranges of nodes. Nodes are the unit of measurement that we sort of talk about when we talk about how much writing there is to do for a character. And we budgeted that uh, very early. Um, we also staged the writing. So on most of the games I've worked on, all the companion writing was done very late in development, um, usually because we reasoned, oh, well, when it's done very late, then we can react to everything that we've written earlier in the game. The problem was companions are huge, and that's an enormous amount of work. So after we did the budgeting, we also broke up the writing for companions into three phases that made the most sense for development. This removed an enormous amount of burden from us because we could focus in each stage of development on a different aspect of companion writing, mm. and it made the, uh, the tail end of companion writing a lot easier for everyone. We also included companion leave conditions. Companions were no longer going to follow you to the ends of the earth. Um, if you piss them off, they would get into an argument with you. They might just get up and leave immediately, um, but they were u- unique to each character, and it added a lot of um, sort of depth to them that was lacking in the first game. And then the final thing is that we added a new... Oh my god, guys, could you imagine consequences in your role-playing games? Could you imagine topic system with reactions and relationship breakpoints. This did not work very well. I think it was a cool idea, and I'm going to talk more about it later. Um, a lot of people criticized that it had a very slow start. Pillars of Eternity had a very slow start, um, and your motivation was very ambiguous. Um, the main villain of the game was kind of hidden from most of Pillars of Eternity. He was a very cool villain, Theos Ex Arcanon, um, but exactly why he was doing what he was doing and why you were chasing him was not super clear. So from the beginning of Deadfire, pacing was a priority. Um, the very beginning of the game is your castle is destroyed and this god breaks his way out and you're almost killed and then the god of death holds your soul ransom and says, please go find Aethys or I'll just snap your soul into nothing. So very clear, very clear motivation for why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, Aethys, this big big dude with the glowing forehead, he is the main antagonist. He's obviously the main antagonist right away. And we did iterate on the pacing a lot. So especially at the beginning of the game, there were a lot of times where we would go and we would cut out small loops. We would cut out nodes of dialogue just to make sure that the introduction to the game was a lot faster and smoother. I, I don't know. I, I really like that sort of slow pacing in Pillars of Eternity 1. I feel like, especially because the game throws so much lingo at me at the start, like that uh, when you're walking around and your team is attacked and all of a sudden there's this weird festival and it's just like, I don't know, anything that's going on and being able to sort of slowly move through the world and take things on uh, at my own pace, I think was really good. Um I guess for replaying, you would probably want the pacing to be a bit faster or maybe a bit more manageable uh, on the user end, but I don't know. I don't. This was not really a complaint I had. Smoother than it was um, for Pillars One. The factions were underdeveloped in Pillars One. Uh, People are going to complain about the game wasting their time. Yeah, I guess. Today, I guess. And when I you guess. Today, you will never see those factions again. And if you play something like Fallout New Vegas, the factions are present almost from the beginning of the game all the way to the end. So that was a misstep. Uh, Deadfire's factions are there pretty much throughout the whole game. As soon as you get to uh, Maje Island, you meet the Juana, you meet the uh, Principe, or sorry, not the Principe, you meet the Valian Trading Company. Shortly thereafter, you meet the Principe and then the Royal Deadfire Company. So very early on, you meet all four of the factions, and they're there with you almost literally up to the. <laughs> the biggest consequence was <laughs> Pillars of Eternity dying as a series after this game flopped. I don't know. I feel like um, I feel like they could. I don't think this is a dead franchise. Like. <clears throat> If they did another Pillars and it was really good, I think, you know, I I just, I don't know. I don't know what it is about Deadfire. I think, like, partly it's, it's it's the branding, like, Pillars of Eternity, Deadfire what is that? Um, you know, because Pillars of Eternity 1 was, a lot of the love for that game came on the front end because of the, uh, not the Patreon, because of the Kickstarter, but... Like, he was talking, he said the villain from Pillars of Eternity 1, he said his name, like, two minutes ago, Garsonox or something. I don't even remember. I don't 100% remember what the story of that game was, because it was just really sort of generic, I feel, and kind of half-baked um, ideas that didn't lead anywhere. And it's like, they, they clearly realized all of it. And you had like that section where you have to choose your God and they have, a, you just read about all the gods and what they're all about. But like, um, 
none of it really sat in for me and none of it stayed with me. I don't think it did anything interesting enough to sort of justify getting really lost in this world. So when you make a sequel to it, I yeah, I think they did the right thing in being like, well, let's do a nautical adventure game now because that's, you know, it's different. But it's also like, well, you know, you're coming into a sequel already. I'm not invested in this world. Um, I love that games like this can still thrive, but I'm not the target audience for it. And also, Pillars of Eternity Deadfire doesn't sound like a sequel. It sounds like an expansion pack. Uh, and it just... Nothing really lands for me to think this is a must-play. But if they did a, a new Pillars of Eternity, I think that actually about that game that doesn't really exist, I think that's said in the Pillars of Eternity universe. But like, if they just did a new Pillars of Eternity and... Uh, they called it, I don't know, Pillars of Eternity 3. Just call it that. Um, and it's just a standalone game. It's not It's not continuing on from the adventures in the first one. It takes place maybe 50 years later or whatever. I think I think he can save this. Uh, Sawyer himself said he doesn't know how to make it work. So yeah, it's dead. I don't know. I feel like... You know, maybe the problem... And this is maybe a bit blasphemous. Maybe the problem is just that you have this group of people working on it when you need somebody new, um, somebody with a lot of radical new ideas about how to approach this sort of design. Um, the story of Pillars of Eternity 1 was souls aren't going to newborn bodies and spoilers, do you find out the gods are fake constructs and there's a good... Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. The souls were... people. There weren't any... People... The, the babies were being born, like stillborn or something like that. I remember that now that you bring it up. And it's like... That actually is an interesting premise now that I remember it, but why didn't I remember it? Um, I feel like it's a cool premise. Maybe the presentation execution wasn't that great. But like, I think there's a lot of interesting ideas in Pillars of Eternity that absolutely warrant you know, being revisited. Um, honestly, I thought it was an expansion, right? Like Dead Fire, it sounds like an expansion. Azor's having a design talk stream. Hi, Garu. Uh, presentation was dog, just walls of text. Uh, yeah, I think there was a lot of that. Um, I think there was a lot of that. I also think, um, maybe this game, like, this universe, maybe it works better as, like, as, like, a Morrowind or, like, like a Fallout where you can just walk around the world and you can experience the world sort of more passively rather than having to stop every 20 seconds to read text. Um, yeah, uh, and they should, <laughs> uh, they should make a sequel to that instead. Sequel to what? What did I say? I forgot what I said. Anyways. Very end of the game, so we did a much better job of including the back. And the balance system they made just made all builds feel bad instead of being specialized. Yeah, maybe. I only played the game once with a very sort of generic, I think it was just a generic, like, sword guy who learned some magics i didn't you know uh, i said tyranny should have had a sequel instead oh yeah yeah sure i can see i can see that especially since you talked about it having that uh, cliffhanger ending um you know what game i really don't like is uh starfield because they went with this whole nasa core aesthetic um and you know it, it is whatever it is but every environment in that game seems so uninteresting, and I'm not playing it, heavens, I'm watching a, a, a lot of it. And I just look at it and I'm like, this should have been Buck Rogers. This should have been like, this should have been the TV show the people in the Fallout universe are watching. That's what this should have been. And it would have been so much better, right? It would have been infinitely better this should have been duck dodgers that's what this should have been uh but instead it's just like oh it, we're, we're grounded and realistic and we're not doing anything interesting um but also we have like bethesda writing but also we have bethesda's presentation system so it's just like ugh. you know all of this is so repulsive you can't do this faux realism when your engine is so bad specifically at that Oh my god, another one of these talks just descends into <laughs> Bethesda slamming. <laughs> um, I've heard people criticize Sawyer for being too obsessed with balance. Yeah. Snorfield. Ooh, what? Ooh, ooh, ooh. The good. They'll let you do somewhat programmable auto casting for combat. All right, all right. 
The moment I heard Bethesda was still doing essential NPCs a decade after New Vegas and New Starfield was garbage and didn't even bother. Yeah, and you know, when you're doing, so when you're doing um, writing for these sorts of games, you have to configure the outcomes to accommodate every choice the player could make. And at every moment, the choice the player has, like the player has the option to initiate combat and acro the faction. And every single, like at every single step, that has to be accommodated. And at every single step, the player has the ability to kill people. That also has to be accommodated into all of these stories. And Bethesda's solution for not, like that's logistically, it's kind of hard to, to script that stuff. Like if in the middle of a conversation, the player decides to rob the people, what should the reaction be? It's like, you know, it's it's interesting. It's interesting to have those sorts of conversations about how to uh, write when the player has so many options at their disposal about how to interact and how to solve problems. And Bethesda's solution is just, ah, well, some people are unkillable. It is such an uninteresting solution to this problem, especially when there are so many cases in Starfield where I feel the player is so justified to just instinctively go for a kill shot. Um, like... The, when the player, um, mm, the, like when the player tries to negotiate for a higher paycheck at the end of a mission and threatens to blackmail the person if they aren't paid a higher wage, uh, there's such a mission in Starfield actually when uh, there's a ship above some resort planet that they blow up, um, and the CEO guy who you're blackmailing is like, huh, "Well, no, I'm not going to pay you that extra money, and also I'm not going to pay you anything now. You overplayed your hand." Um, that the player is so reasonable in killing him. That is such an obvious thing for a character. Like, th like just role-playing-wise, that's such a reasonable thing to expect a player to want to do. And the fact that that guy's unkillable, I'm like, what are you doing here? I don't... I, I haven't finished the, uh, the, the VOTs. I probably... I don't know if I will. It's a really boring game. Uh, I like the streamer, though. But... I can't imagine that, uh, like, that's a main story character. Why is he not killable? He should absolutely be killable. He's such a nothing character. Um, um, can't comment on Starfield. The promotional material showed the gunplay being terrible, that uh, so terrible that I just wrote it off. Yeah, that's another thing with, like, the combat in Starfield. Um, with Fallout 4, they did this thing where after you kill an enemy or you're just about to, they level up and they regain all their health, and it's like... This is such a shitty system. Nobody likes this. And it's still in Starfield. It is so bad. Ugh. Um, and I also hate... I just... I don't... I don't know. I don't love leveling with guns. I don't think... I just... I don't know. It just doesn't work for me. I think that if you want to make an area more difficult... Um, like, just put more enemies there. Put more turrets there. Or give them more powerful guns. Uh, but don't give them, like, endless health. And if the player has to level up, have it be like, well, you know, the players may be more proficient at fixing guns. So have, like, a stat that the guns break down, like in System Shock 2 or something. I don't know. Like, maybe these are terrible pitches, but I really, really don't like it when Bethesda does combat. I think it's really kind of balls. Um, uh, when Morrowind didn't want you to kill an important ruler, they gave him one of the best defensive equipment in the game. <laughs> Uh, I don't remember that. Who was was that? That wasn't Vivek. Who was that? Um, mm, 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 oh my God! God of War. Uh, the side content keeps track of almost everything you've seen, and dialogues have multiple possibilities depending on what you did or didn't do yet. Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't really like those new God of War games, but um, and it's it's much it's much easier to script that in a God of War than it is in something like a Fallout because it's an open world game, but. Like that's that still doesn't excuse it, right? You know, if you're if you're making an open world game, you kind of are on the hook for that because the open world setting, it it gives you it makes a lot of stuff easier actually. Like counterintuitively, in many ways, making an open world game is much easier than making uh, a sort of linear narrative driven game. Uh, but there's also some things that are going to be harder, and I think Bethesda kind of should be raked a bit over the coals for all of the shortcuts they take. Um, uh, I'm glad there's finally other devs making scrolls like Fall Scrolls, <laughs> Fall of Avalon, and Wayward Realms all the way. 100% uh, agree, Acer, gun damage shouldn't level. Yeah. Um, maybe, you know what? Mm, I don't know. I like. Maybe. 
maybe auto aiming or like aim assist i mean maybe aim assist should be tethered a bit to combat just to be like we're gonna give you a little bit of an extra nudge to be more proficient at hitting the enemies but i don't know i don't even know about that um they could use penetration as a stat on guns so you just can't hurt people with too strong armor like they could do anything anything can work um King Helseth, he wears royal. He wears a royal signet ring, which is like one of the best defensive equipment in the game, uh, because amongst other things, it gets you complete immunity to magic. Ooh, ooh. But yeah, let's keep going. Um, maybe, maybe we just need to do a Bethesda Slam video. Uh, <laughs> also central of the political conflict of the Go era. back to the chess Bethesda club, Todd Howard, you I nerd. Have to take full responsibility for this. So we have this very strong start with Aethys going, blam, and then he's, you know, like going across the ocean and the gods are like you got to follow that dude and then as you're following him there are all these factions that are fighting over the dead fire and players logically were like so i'm following that guy it seems like there's a lot of fighting going on here am i supposed to be helping figure out who controls the dead fire or how does this tie together and i didn't do a very good job of actually tying those things together there were two cool plot points that didn't mesh very well but overall we did a lot more planning maybe instead of calling the game dead fire like sales wise you should have called it pillars of eternity 2 the one where the dead god steals your freaking soul should do i think that helped a great deal um and every faction had a companion champion this was extremely important so all the characters at the bottom are associated with a faction. oh yes 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 yes, 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 yes. i love that i love that i love that every time if you're going to do a faction i love it when you give me an npc companion that's associated with a faction so i know what the faction is about and i always have that faction's perspective on the world with me so that i can sort of see the world from more than one perspective it's it's just it's such it's basic it's you know it's it's um, depending on the alliances you make, role playing, playing adventure game 101 come on extremely sort of hard ass about being dedicated to the billion trading company but um there was actually something that a long time ago chris avalon had made a very strong point where he said like you should always have a companion that is a mouthpiece the pillars 2 game the story so was a full that. sleeper Ooh. we did have a backer beta um we had a backer beta on pillars 1 as well there are some tricky things about backer betas um it's very limited content and it's a very limited audience i think anyone who's done early access also knows that there are dangers to this um for those of you who want to do this type of thing understand that your audience is self-selected to the most hardcore, enthusiastic people. They give very good feedback, but it is also feedback for psychotic gamers. Like, they have the most... The That's true. Opinions. That's they're true. Like, they're going to just grind your game into the dust. Um, it is very valuable, but it can kind of skew your understanding of... This is you guys. This is you guys, by the way. ...of how your game plays for a wider audience. Um, also, the longer a beta goes on, <laughs> it becomes a well-trod path. Um, that content that you put out, unless you're going to put out a bunch of new content every time you update the backer beta, people are going to just run that over, over, and over, and over again, and it can lead to a very strange perception of difficulty, for example, or quality of writing, because no writing really seems that great if you've seen it 20 times. So there's a little bit of a, a problem sometimes with content that gets overused and over-iterated on. For us, we didn't have, um, we didn't have any companion or story uh, elements in the game. We wanted to keep that under wraps, so we didn't get feedback on that. Also, our early, this is our earliest content, and that's often the, the worst content. <laughs> and sometimes yeah, I feel with maybe content. with a backer beta, if you want to avoid this stuff, um, maybe maybe don't promo new new areas and new stories. Like maybe promo the new mechanics and the sort of revamped uh, system. So like take an area from the first game and put together a small team to you to sort of integrate that into the new game and create a sort of smaller scale story there from beginning to end. It's like, um, you know, it's like a small taste of what's to come. And then when the full game has released, you can sort of release that as a, I don't know, $5 little extra. You know, um, a lot of times I've worked on a game and the very first stuff you do, not only is it sort of bad in execution. Sounds like they just didn't want feedback. Why even have a beta? Uh, I mean, I think the beta is a good way to sort of entice uh, support port uh if they're doing like kickstarter and stuff but it's also mm, uh, uh, you know i think i think the sort of hardcore audience feedback is valuable but it's also valuable to a point and you kind of need to sift through what you can take and what you can't take from them continuing the bethesda conversation uh as an outsider to those games I think the problem with Starfield is leveraging mechanics and systems from Fallout Elder Scrolls into a faux simulator game. I think that's very fair. I think that's a very f good take. Um, it's also, you know, um, so let's actually, you know, let's put this aside for five minutes and let's talk about Snails Have Skeletons and how that game came about. Uh, I was originally making a game called The Lord of Unwanted Things. And what it was is 
I was going to do just a retelling of Silent Hill 4 with Zelda mechanics, and I was going to throw in some Kingsfield and Demon Souls as well. And I had sort of written the story, I had sort of planned everything out, I knew where I wanted everything to go. And the reason I did the snail demo originally, the one that I released uh, and people got to play, was that I hadn't ever, like I hadn't spent I hadn't tuned all of these mechanics and all these systems into one cohesive package, so I didn't know 100% how good it was going to get. And making the snail beta, I, uh, snail demo, I realized that, oh, uh, a lot of this stuff just doesn't work. And a lot of the stuff works in ways that I didn't even understand it was going to work. And so when I released the snail demo to sort of get feedback from people, um, I went back to working on the Lord of Unwanted Things. And I just gave up and I decided I actually need to go back to Snail and make that a full game because I'd been going about things the wrong way. And that's like maybe a year of development that I wasted because I had had this huge game, like this idea for a game I wanted to do. And the, the game that I made wasn't really good at telling the story that I wanted to tell. Whereas Snail... That was not planned out. I just had mechanics and I just tested my way into having an actual narrative. So that story sprung up very organically from the mechanics. Um, and that's, that is how you make video games. That's a much, like, you do not come into this with the story written out. You can have like ideas about what you want to do. That's fine. But this is like the Fumito Ueda observation. The story has to come downstream of the mechanics. And what you're talking about there with Starfield is that um, Starfield is very obviously not written for the Fallout uh, Elder Scrolls gameplay. It is just obviously it doesn't work with this. This should this should be something different. I don't think the game there's any like there is no reason for the exploration because there's nothing to find. It's just caches of like oh you found credits and you found some guns that you can sell and you found found some uniforms and like yeah there are quests but it's so desolate and empty and. It's but like the game also gives you like the jetpack so you can travel faster, but also they don't give you a vehicle so you can travel faster. And it's like uh, the exploration doesn't really neatly thread into the main story either because it has that Skyrim problem of you go from A to B to C to D. And if you're going to do that, then you kind of need to go with Fallout New Vegas's approach of um, we're doing a story that is told in sort of a linear way. And so the map is going to unlock very naturally alongside how you um, uh, alongside with how the story uh, unlocks. So like you you basically just do a big loop around New Vegas and you complete the story of New Vegas. It's it's a bit more complicated, but like the map and the the story being told they congeal really well together. Um, so the exploration always gets you closer to the main story, and the main story always. Uh, advances your exploration and the map is not as exciting to explore as something like Fallout 3 but it's a it's a lot better fit for what kind of story they're telling and now in Starfield it's like why am I able to land on these planets what am I supposed to do here just shoot up enemies because that you know I'm sorry but your shooting mechanics suck I don't want to do that um <laughs> uh, uh, counterpoint Elder Scrolls from Oblivion onwards are failed immersive sims the mechanics are right for sims the devs are just lazy see New Vegas for contrast yeah like I don't particularly love the Elder Scrolls after Morrowind um, Morrowind is the only Elder Scrolls game that I like really really like uh, I haven't played Daggerfall but I imagine I'd probably like that I have to just try to see um, but yeah uh, they also feel like they're not taking advantage of the mechanics that they have and Rather than, like like we talked about with the player is able to kill everyone. In Morrowind, you can fly. You can teleport. And like you can levitate over the map. Um, you can't do that in subsequent Elder Scrolls games because then they would need to actually sort of design the quests around the player being able to do that. And it just turns out that it's easier to design the quests if you take that away from the player. But if... You know, Todd Howard has said many times that when the the games he makes are all about letting the player do anything in his worlds. And to that end, like you, you look at that philosophy and you go, 
well, yeah, you can sort of do anything, but there's no consequences because to do anything, you must be able to ally with everyone. And to ally with everyone, nobody can have like a no you policy. So even if you try to kill one of the Jarls in Skyrim, they're not going to die. And like you can't, like you can do anything except if it would get in the way of you doing something else. And it's like, these are games that are really interested in letting you pick up a bucket and rotate the bucket in your hand, but there's no point to it. Like you, there's no reason to ever pick up and rotate those buckets. So why is the feature there? What are you doing with this? Um, are there non-humanoid aliens in Starfield? I don't think so. I think it's very. Uh, I think it's a very human story, which I respect. I do really prefer sci-fi that doesn't have aliens, like uh, like Dune. Uh, Dune is the story of human beings. Um. I think developers that assume hardcore gamers are not representative of who will play the game are completely off base. They are your core audience and ones that will sell your games through word of mouth. Yeah, that's that's also fair. I mean, um, the people, like the sort of, uh, if you ever read books about marketing, they talk about mavens. Mavens are people who like, you know, everybody has a friend who knows a lot about cars. They know everything about cars. They know about every car, every brand, every model that comes out. And they know what's a good car and what's a bad car. And this is just actively their zone of interest. And those people, they push only the best stuff. And this, this the mavens exist in all industries. There's like movie mavens. These people know about every great movie that comes out. And these people are what tell us about movies like Gonjiam, Haunted Asylum, or Incantation right? These sort of smaller movies that don't have $100 million marketing budgets. Um, mavens are the most valuable people to have on site. But these are the people that are really sort of deep in it. And um, the word of mouth they generate is so much more valuable than any other form of marketing. And you never, ever, 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 ever want to piss them off or spite them because... Uh, like, the, it was Mavens that sort of made Bethesda. Like, they played Daggerfall. They played Morrowind. And they were like, this is amazing. And then um, the general consumer, there's always a lack, but they always follow them. Like, it's kind of like fashion. It flows from these sort of hardcore people, and then it, it comes down to gen pop uh, and these sorts of more, like I said, uh, general mainstream audiences, and they start playing it. But... Um, they don't necessarily connect to the things that the Mavens connected with. And now that Bethesda is chasing the mainstream audience and they don't have any connection to the Mavens anymore, how long do you think the Bethesda train is going to keep on rolling? Like, is the Elder Scrolls 6, I mean, like that, that it'll probably make money, but I, like this is going to be, there is a, re, there's just a return on investment problem heading their way where at a certain point, the general, like nobody trusts Bethesda at launch anymore. And, that is a very big problem for them as a studio because they were bought by Xbox and the whole promise was that, yeah, this is going to make it, you know, we're, we're, it's, going to, it's even better for us to be owned by Xbox. But I'm just looking at Starfield and it's a buggy mess again. And you can't keep getting away with this shit because people are going to notice. Um, and whereas something like From Software, I mean, my God, uh, as much as I do think they have strayed away from their sort of more hardcore principles over the years, I can just play Armored Core 6 and I'm like, oh no, they're, they're still a very creative-driven studio. That's very obvious here. Uh, and they, they like have a really deep sense of love, uh, a really deep sense of uh, what kind of games they should make. And there's clearly a lot of love that went into this uh, and craft, which I feel is missing often in Bethesda. Uh, once again, your Quan Master is the superior... Or Quan Masters is the superior space game. Uh, there are alien animals in Starfield. That's true. That's true. There are alien animals there. Um, you can do anything so long as it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's uh, that's a great way of putting it, Cyber Ninja Zero. Um, uh, that's my dissonance with Bethesda games. Having the freedom for the sake of freedom is not fun for me. Yeah, and it's also not freedom. Like freedom, if you can, if you have the freedom to do anything, what are you gonna do? You're just gonna walk around or like. Mm, because like you no, know, the quality is in is in the craft. It's in the direction. You know, it's how like survival mechanics are always best in horror games. They're never as good in actual just out and out survival games because when the challenge, when the direction is handcrafted rather than being just systemized across a randomly generated map, um, when it's actually directed by a human being, it's always going to come out much much better. Um, 
Azure, what about the coral race as aliens? Ooh, that's true. They are aliens, actually. Uh, I talk about this in the Armored Core 6 video uh, because I actually talk about Dune surprisingly much in that game because there's a lot in that game from Dune. Um, and I talk about how Armored Core had gone to space before, but it didn't really have aliens. Uh, it didn't have sort of non-human entities outside of AIs and that uh, the coral is sort of a... That's probably the biggest departure Fires of Rubicon makes is that it's a sort of Miyazaki uh, esoteric game about like the transient borders of metaphysical concepts such as existence and humanity and stagnation and, and, and Kegare, don't worry, I talked about Kegare. Whereas when Toshifumi and Abishima made those games, it was all about um, power and into whose powers, sh into whose hands shall the power to uh, govern mankind be placed into and um, like the difference between human beings and machines. And how um, how if you can if you can create a system that compels human beings to just mindlessly follow orders, what exactly makes them different from machines who just do the same thing? Mm. This morning I heard a podcast where a guy talked for thirty minutes about how Starfield is an amazing game. Sounds like a very divisive game. Yeah, I think it's also just what are you asking for? If you're, I, I'm 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 sure that. Anybody who plays Starfield can have a lot of fun with it. Like, if you just want to sort of turn off your brain and engage. But I don't think anybody 20 years from now is going to be talking about Starfield. I don't think there's anything going on in that game. Um, I, like, maybe conceptually. Because if you listen to Todd Howard, he was on the Lex Friedman podcast talking about the game of, a while ago. And you could really get a sense into his head as a designer uh, in that conversation. Because it's like a three-hour conversation or something like that. Um, and there was one moment specifically where he talked about there's no way to ever get stuck on a planet. They tested it and they just didn't feel it worked really well, which is like, okay, that tells me a lot about how you approach game design, where player freedom, player, like the ability of the player to make the choice to not be here anymore is more important to you than the player having to make the decision whether to go somewhere for fear of getting stranded. Like, that's interesting, but... Starfield itself, this game has no cultural legacy. Nobody is going to be talking about that game twenty years from now um, because it doesn't it doesn't do anything. Whereas Morrowind, people are still talking about Morrowind every time Bethesda makes a game. Some asshole is online being like, "Wow, well, they don't make them like Morrowind anymore, huh?" <laughs> and 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 we we're still going to be around twenty years from now. Twenty years from now, you know, when I'm in my thirties, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna be there, and Todd Howard's gonna release The Elder Scrolls Eight, and I'll be like, it's not as good as Morrowind. <laughs> uh, Armored Core Six is Bloodborne Two. Yes, it is. It is Ostrava. That's actually a very good take. Um, Institute, you know, the research institute. What is that if not Bergenworth? You're telling me Nagai and Willem are that different? They actually are because. Um, they sort of split on what they believe the right path for humanity is. But it's very much like these building blocks that Miyazaki toys around with in all of his games. Yeah, you should expect all of them in uh, <laughs> in Armored Core 6. Uh, um, player expression is more important than player freedom. Mm, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, 20 years from now, Elder Scrolls 8. Funniest joke in the stream. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, get under the hood, it's such a mess that if you try to like pull out and redo it, it's a problem. I heard Armored Core 6 doesn't have my Husbando patches. Okay, it doesn't. But them from patches was in Armored Core 4. I think it was in Armored Core 4. I don't think it was in 4 answer. I think it was in 4. He was he was in either one of those games. And um mm, mm, Give me one second. I just need to verify. Uh, 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 God damn it. <laughs> I need to verify <laughs> which game he was in. Armored Core 4 Patches. Mm -mm. Okay, he was in Armored Core for answer. Damn it. Uh, but anyways, he was in Armored Core for answer and he was voiced by Patrick Seitz. Your daddy in Armored Core 6 is Handler Walter, and he's also voiced by Patrick Seitz. 
So if you want a headcanon that your husbando is now your sort of daddy dom handler Walter, you know, it's the same voice actor, so... Um, uh, is in for answer? Yeah, 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 yeah. I miss Patch is kicking me down into a deep chasm. Handler Walter sends you into a deep, dark chasm. Don't you worry. You know, you got him. He's there. <laughs> so sometimes backers can get the sense that you aren't really doing very much with content. Also, because I'm running out of sort of fun GDC talk videos, uh, I might just start streaming video games or some crap like that. Uh, <laughs> or I might do like... Um, like that video where it's like Fallout 3 is better than you think. I really like that video because it, it you know, Fallout 3, it, it does a lot of good stuff. Um, and it gets really, I think if not for Fallout New Vegas, people would not have turned on Fallout 3. I feel like so many people have. Um, I might just do sort of talk throughs on those videos. But like, I feel this is a lot more open season because they put this out there in its entirety. Whereas like those videos... I feel like you need to engage a lot more with them to justify streaming them um, because otherwise people could just watch those videos. Hard to do anything with it. It Stream Gothic. Like That's like a really long game, man. That's why Walter sounded such daddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, I'm pretty sure it's Patrick's side. Hold on. Um, uh, ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Uh, video games, video games, video games, video games. Um, Patrick Sides. Oh, hey, he's also a sloth in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. That's interesting. This isn't video games, though. Animation, films. I don't care about films. Who was he in One Piece? He was Frankie. He's Frankie? Oh my god, he voices Frankie in One Piece? No way. Oh! <gasps> He also voices Dio in JoJo in the English one. I never watched the uh, I never watched the English one. Hold on, I need to I need to see this one. Oh my god, he oh my god, Handler Walter is voiced by Frankie. <laughs> no, say it ain't so. No. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> Uh, uh, video games, let's see, video games, video games, 2000, was it 2009, 2000 something, um, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, Handler Walter, yep, a lot of revelations coming out in this stream today. <laughs> Our cyber Mac Daddy. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! So back beta, a lot of the new mechanics were completely astonishing. We did get great feedback on that. We made a lot of good changes based on player feedback. Yeah, it's a long game, and you have to get a start on that analysis. So, chop, chop. <laughs> I played Fallout 3 after Fallout New Vegas. It never stood a chance. Ooh! Ooh! How about the game launch? It still sucks. And there are a lot of technical issues. So it was worth doing. They did really find a lot of stuff, both from a gameplay perspective and also a technical perspective. Yeah, the Fallout 3 and 4 are better than you think vids are good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I really, yeah, you, those are exactly the ones I'm talking about. I really like the third one. I really like the fourth one because I think Fallout 4 is so much easier to hate. Um, because, like, if you compare Fallout 4 to Starfield, and I love how you can always sort of be like, well, Fallout 4 isn't that bad. Just look at Starfield. And it's like, well, Fallout 3 isn't that bad. Just look at Fallout 4. You're like, you know, every new Bethesda game retroactively makes the previous ones better. <laughs> um, but with the Fallout 4 one, there's so much to dislike about that game. And I do think it is sort of warranted to defend it because it's not all bad. I do think, like, it, it, it has so much better exploration. If you just want to play a game that's about exploring and just the sort of raw serotonin, dopamine rush of exploration, Fallout 4, you really can't do that much better than that. If you don't care about anything else, you know, yeah. That, uh, help the final game in the long run. The only credit I'll give to Fallout 3 is that I think it's better than Skyrim. Yeah. That's a cold take. That's a cold uh, take. The full VO was awesome. Everyone loved it. Uh, the main plot was too short, which is sort of true. If you just cruise straight through, it can be a very short experience. The game itself is very big. Um, 
There were ambiguous stakes in the main plot. Again, there was this confusion between the main plot and the sort of the actual plot. East. Uh, the <laughs> the East fans are revealing themselves. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people, we had these minor uh. characters called sidekicks. They weren't full companions. Um, a lot of people, they always want more companions. So we had added these mini companions. We said we can't write full, like we can't write 10 full companions. So here's a couple of minor companions called sidekicks. And people are like, we want them to be full companions. Why'd you include them at all? Which, you know, is questionable. I still think that the game is better for having them, but people did want them to be fully fleshed out. Hey, another description of combat is bad. The reviewers said it was bad. The players said it was bad. So in the short term, after launching, uh, there were a couple things that we couldn't really do anything about. Anything that had to do with the main plot and the villain, you know, that's that's my fault. That's how I wrote the main plot of the story. There's not a whole lot you can do in the short term to fix, you know, just sort of fundamental structural issues with the game and the story. Ship to ship combat, we did make changes to the UI. We made balance changes that helped. Again, though, fundamentally, people who didn't like the system just were never going to like it. Uh, the companion relationships seemed all over the place. The tuning was really crazy. So we did we did some tuning. We did some new tagging of relationships. I'll go into that. Um, the most important thing I think we did is that we displayed a record of changes between your companions' relationships. Because a lot of times people would get to a point where they'd say, like, why do these characters hate each other? I have no idea why. So the companion relationship page would actually show all of the steps that had led to that point. There wasn't any silver bullet for performance optimizations. We did what we could, but we found that in a lot of cases, our AI, <clears throat> especially in big areas like Nakataka, the main city, was just really atrocious. Um, there wasn't an easy way to split those levels up. We didn't want to pull a lot of NPCs out and potentially screw things up, so that was difficult to deal with. And then difficulty, there were two things that we did. If we found what I call the tall blades of grass, we would cut those. So okay. people hate this. See, yeah, <laughs> this is what this is what Chad was talking about earlier, where he's obsessed with balancing. <laughs> Everyone knows that people hate this, so do it as early as possible. If there's one character build that is just ludicrously powerful and like nine out of ten people use it because it's just such a joke, while at the same time saying, I hate how easy this game is, nerf that build. <laughs> okay, no, that's, yeah, he's right about that. This is a game all about like player expression. If there is a really obvious optimal build that everybody is sort of just nuts into because it's so much better than everything else, you need to nerf that. That is an absolutely, absolutely correct approach uh, in this situation. Um, very quickly, just change it, cut it out as quickly as you can. Um, the other stuff that we did is we started doing all the encounter tuning that we should have done earlier. So now we're gonna talk about controversial factors. Um, the five character party. Again, we had feedback that combat was hard to follow. Um, larger parties usually mean that there are more enemies in the battle. Makes sense. That's true. Um, Pillars characters are more active than characters in Baldur's Gate and Icewind Dale, on average. Characters like fighters and rogues and rangers in the uh, Or maybe that build was just fun and good and others clunky shit stuff should get buffed. Um, yeah, but like I'm specifically talking about a scenario where it actually just is a bit too much, uh, is a bit too powerful. I believe there was... Now I'm going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons tabletop patching. Um... I believe there was some problem in some version of Dungeons and Dragons, and chat, feel free to correct me here, but the monk class can do like two attacks per turn because of some perk, and there was some way of building that into an actual overpowered build at like really low levels, so they had to fix that. Um, I think that... Like, you know, there's obviously a difference between this build is too powerful and so players just kind of get nuts into it. Like, like Skyrim, like the stealth archer build in Skyrim. That's a problem in that game because every other way of fighting is so obviously inferior. Um, and like the problem there is that, yeah, you know, I don't want to be swinging my sword and losing a lot of health when I can just stealth archer my way through everything. I'd be an idiot to not stealth archer my way through. Um, so that's a case of you need to actually let the player do more damage. I think it's ridiculous how little damage we do in Skyrim. I would have us do like five times as much damage uh, at every instance. Because, oh my god, you know, Skyrim is not a hard game. Why am I struggling so much against some of these enemies? It's ridiculous. Um, but in something like Pillars of Eternity, if you have a build that is so... Like, if every build is viable, but one build is so much better that it just sort of overshines every other one, yeah, nerf that. Uh, don't nerf Stealth Archer, Archer. Add Stealth Spells. Make stronger attacks with two-handed. Yeah, like, those those are um, maybe a bit better, uh, specifically because what I said, that I think that, generally speaking, the problem with Stealth Archer is just that every other way of fighting is just too ridiculously hard. Um, it's like, it's so weird how much health you can lose in Skyrim. It's ridiculous. ...games didn't have a whole lot to do. In Pillars, potentially, they have a lot more to do. That means that you're spending a lot more time managing every character. Um, we found that our UIs were cramped by... Uh, do you think we can get a new From Software horror game? Uh, 
I think, yeah, like, anything can happen. Um, I would love for them to do another horror game. Uh, I don't think it's unlike, like, I don't know. I feel like, because we don't know any game they're working on anymore, uh, which is a really weird place to be in, because when, I think it was when... Um, Sekiro came out. They were. They said that they were working on one dark fantasy game. They were working on a. Uh, they were. Yeah, they were working on a dark fantasy game. that was like a sequel, spiritual sequel to Dark Souls. They were working on an experimental game, and they were working on a mech game, and that turned out to be Elden Ring, Terrasine, and um, and Armored Core Six. And maybe it wasn't Terrasine. It was something, uh, or or maybe it was. Yeah, maybe Sekiro was that other experimental game. I may be confusing the timeline here. Uh, but so we don't actually know what they're working on behind the scenes. I'd hazard a guess that we are going to get an Elden Ring 2. I think that's you know, pretty locked in. Uh, and if we do, I would love... Because the cool thing with Elden Ring is that it's such an open format. Like Dark Souls has like a pretty locked in story. But Elden Ring, you can really like... There's, there's a million different ways you can shape up the world. And I would love for there to be an area that's like the anti kalit And that's like the rune. It's the rune of purity. But um, it's like soap. It's, it's, it's artificial purity to the point of sterilization. Uh, I think that's a very interesting idea that I'd love to see. Sort of a, a sterile, soaped up kingdom uh, sanitized to death. Um, but yeah, I, I think we are going to get an Elden Ring too. I would really like it if we got a spin-off to Armored Core, Fires of Rubicon. I would love it if Masaru Yamamura himself got to sort of lead the creative project, uh, the creative process there more so than uh, the way Armored Core 6 was made, where Miyazaki was in charge during the early days and then the project was passed on to Yamamura. I would also, I would like to see another Sekiro just to sort of, you know, we're taking the Sakura Dragon back to Korea. I think that would be interesting. I would want to play that. I don't want that to be like a trilogy. I think you can just knock that out in one more game. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe I'm still holding out hope, guys. <laughs> the Tomoe Takiru DLC. It's coming. It's coming. I Trust me. Uh, Acer wants to go to a soap land. Unironically, yes. I think I think soap land is the most interesting setting you could make in, in, in Elden Ring 2. Uh, and yeah, we're getting Shadow of the Earth 3. I mean, like, full release games here. Um, but other than that, I don't think we know anything they're working on. But I would really like to see them tackle another horror game. That's probably my... Yeah, it's probably my most sort of sought-after game from them right now. Acer didn't get the pun, must not have played Yakuza. No, I only play good games. <laughs> I actually played the first hour of Yakuza 0. I liked it, but I didn't go back to it. Um, also, we followed the same sort of approach... Kuan 2. You don't need to make Kuan 2. You can make something new. <laughs> Shadow Tower 3. ...very hard to keep the player's attention with regard to pacing. You're starting with one character doing a very small number of things, then you have two, then you have three, then you have four, then you have five. As you're getting more characters, they're advancing in levels, and they're getting more things to do per character, so it is this really crazy explosion of potential maintenance that you have to do. So this is a big challenge. Um, mm, in Pillars mm, of Eternity, mm. you would usually get Adair as your first companion. Aquanite 4. <sighs> Aquanite 4. Didn't they already make that game? She, was a ranger. she actually added two characters. So you're That's a really seven, funny... Um, and a lot of times we heard people give feedback. They said, I always forgot about one. I don't, I don't remember. KZ have told me that there was an Echo Knight 4, but it wasn't an Echo Knight game. It was like one of their mech games was technically Echo Knights 4 or something like that. I don't remember. Shadow Tower 1 remake. You don't need to remake that game. You can make something new. Uh, Kuan 2, how many times can we teach you this lesson, old <laughs> man? <laughs> the only made three. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, uh, because like the first one is Victorian and then by the end it's like of the series, it's gone to space or something like that. And then it's like, well, technically speaking, this here game that they made after uh, after uh, Echo Knight 3 um, kind of, sort of, actually works as an Echo Knight 4. I don't remember what game it was. Uh, you need to ask her. You need to ask her. Angry potato. And that didn't seem great. So... Implementing this was actually really easy. We were already planning on reskinning the HUD and UI anyway. <clears throat> Lowering the party limit was not hard. The battle sizes came down. We had fewer enemies per fight. Which ending would you base Elden Ring 2 on? Oh, um, 
I would set Elden Ring to 10,000 years in the future, and I would just not address the ending to Elden Ring 1. I'd just be like, you know, that ending happened, and that age came about, and that end, and that era also ended. And another age came out, and now that era is ending, and now a new era. Like, it's, like, the happenings in Elden Ring 1 are so far in the prehistory of the world that there's really nothing, you know, we, there's no reason to address even what happened there. But if you have to uh, take an ending to Elden Ring 1 and make that the canon ending, the Rani ending is, like, the Rani ending feels like that was the main quest. It's so much, it's so, it's so much more integrated into the actual experience of the game than all the other endings that it's like, yeah, this was probably, like, they probably debated internally about, like, why isn't this just the main story? This is so obviously, like, has so much more love put into it than all the other ones. Uh, do you mean frame grind? I might mean frame grind. I might mean Dorasane. I don't remember. Um, yeah, I'd have to ask Casey. Um, the post, 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 post apocalypse. Yeah, yeah. Though, here's the thing. It's okay. uh, why would it be Elden Ring then? If Elden Ring is uh, Elden Beast itself, I think a new verse might be a better decision. Yeah, that's also fine. But I mean, like, if the premise of Elden Ring as a franchise is just that it's sort of like the Wheel of Time, uh, where you have the Elden Ring itself exists as a sort of metaphysical concept of what the prevailing order is. And it's an actual physical object, and you can you can bend it around and change the reality of like the way the world around you is structured. Uh, so you can remove death from it, you can remove time from it, you can remove stagnation from it, and you can remove uncleanliness from it, or you can remove purity from it. Like you can you can add stuff to it, and you can change things around in it. And just just taking that as a premise, I think that's a really solid framework on which to really expand this franchise. And you can basically do anything. You're not locked into one solid continuity. Um, because, like, the Elden Ring changes over time. It's changed many times in the history of Elden Ring 1. Like, if someone's like, I don't, that's dumb, I don't like it. But they're not, like, really angry. If it actually is making a good change in the game, just, just do that. Just keep going. There yeah, that that's, really, that's really, right, really Joss Sawyer. Like, I'm not playing this game if it has fewer than six characters, which is, you know, a weird thing in this world to be that mad about. But um, there were some people that really didn't like it, and that's just how they how they felt. Um, the logic was like, well, Baldur's Gate and Icewind Dale had six character parties, ergo, and Pillars 1 had a six character party, ergo, kind of ignoring the fact that we received all this feedback, like, whoa, this is a lot to manage. Um, overall. Okay, so, yeah, but like, I, I agree with this decision for all of the reasons he cited, but I hate when people do this, where they're like, well, you don't like a five party, uh, you don't like the new system, but you also didn't like the old system. Like, uh, maybe the people who are complaining about this aren't the same people who complained about the other thing. You know, it's not like, you know, there's no mob. There's only like some people who like and dislike some things. There are, there are no Batman fans. There are people who are fans of Batman. And independently, they have very different takes on what makes that license interesting. Um, and treating them as a monolith is always stupid. It's always stupid. People said that the combat was easier to follow. So would I do it again? Yeah, probably. I mean, a lot of it depends on the way your combat is structured. Um, if we didn't have real-time with pause combat, maybe six characters are fine, maybe maybe 10 characters are fine. Go play some Battle Brothers, get 12 characters in there. You know, like, who cares? Um, you could have huge battles if you really want to. But a lot of it depends on the context. But for this game, I would totally make the choice again. The companion relationship mechanics. I'm going to dive a little bit into the weeds here just because there's a murky system here that was very confusing and frustrating for people. What are you talking about? <laughs> the companion relationship mechanics. So... The way that companions would change their relationship. I feel like Elden Ring One being handled as a prehistoric world, uh, as a pre as prehistoric, would kind of ruin the frenzied flame ending, where you're just halting the world and successful in ending all forms of all life. I get the appeal of the potential, though. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, maybe specifically that ending. Um, yeah, maybe uh, maybe specifically that ending would uh, would not add up so much but like we don't know um shadow of the earth tree hasn't dropped yet and uh melina was pretty adamant that she was going to hunt down the lord of the frenzied flame and you know maybe mikola had some contingencies in uh in in store for the lord of the frenzied flame we don't really know what happens afterwards um the Etz <laughs> frenzied flame is the Etz lord ending 
relationship to you and to each other was largely through the system called um, so you see these little frenzied flame would never be sequelized maybe the frenzied flame is the horror game we're looking for hey 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 she likes people that are anti-religious she likes people that say anamancy is cool every time a character says something that's tagged with that topic she goes yeah okay this is the most interesting part of this video there's sort of like a uh, procedural and not an emote but basically a reactive line where paladin is like yeah and um and then her reputation goes up with that character and then over time that builds toward a break point, either positive or negative. And then once you hit that break point, you know, there's an emotional sort of explosion. The character is like, I think you're awesome. Thanks for being so great and hating religion. Or they say like, you know, like, I love you. You're the best. Um, and then you as a player can either interact with that or just say, <clears throat> sorry, I don't want to deal with it. Which actually a lot of people did. There were certain conflicts where players would just kind of like back away and let things take their course. Uh, so what problem was I trying to solve? I believe that there is a space between doing purely hand scripted reactivity for characters and things that feel more topical and I don't want to say procedural, but a little more mechanically driven. If you look at something like Fallout 4, you have companions that will react to things like picking locks or stealing, which are sort of devoid of context, and that's mechanically driven. On the other hand, if you have a thing where characters only respond to very specific lines that every character says, that's a lot of work, and it feels very special casey, like you have to take certain routes through the game to hit a certain breakpoint with a character. So what this was trying to do is say, hey, there are all of these topics that people talk about throughout the world. Let's use the fact that the player makes hundreds of dialogue choices that sort of intersect with these topics, and companions make tons of offhand comments, and use that to do mechanical work behind the scenes so the player will feel that it's a more organic way of building a relationship. So that when two characters decide that they're buddies or they hate each other's guts, the player's like, makes sense because every time this character keeps saying something that's anti-religious, this other character keeps going <laughs> until they just explode and go crazy. And the player's like, yeah, I saw that happening. Makes sense. This is the most interesting thing to come out of this game. So this, uh, this idea for uh, systemizing player relationships with uh, their companions. Here we go, the interaction system, oh yeah. But also, this interaction system didn't really work because, um, well, he's about to explain it. Also, I don't quite remember. So the implementation was actually really easy. The mechanics of this were very straightforward. Um, How much horizontal tango is there in Pillars of Eternity games? I don't think there's a lot of sex in them. I hate role-playing games that have sex. I don't get it. I don't get why people lose their minds over like, oh my god, in a Baldur's Gate game, I can turn into a bear and have sex with like the bear warlock. It's like, you can just, you know, you can just watch porn. Right? If you're really so sex-starved that you need it in your video game... Like, it, it's it's never good in a video game where they're trying to sort of uh, systemize relationships like that. It's just... It, it's always weird. It's always really just strange. I don't get it. I don't get why people put it in their games. I don't get why people like interacting with it so much. Just, you know, if, you're, if you really need it, just watch porn. You hate Witcher games? You hate classic Fallout? <laughs> calling me out here listen listen sex doesn't belong in video games it belongs in the dark under the sheets um under the judgmental eye of god between the woman you're married to and nobody else <laughs> there are these hentai games if you want an interactive visual novel <laughs> The designers had a difficult time really understanding it. Part of that is because I it belongs in a museum. <laughs> what it needed to be. It had a lot of a lot of adjustability and fine tuning that ultimately proved to be very difficult to wrap your head around. Um, tuning was very difficult for a number of reasons. So again, the goal of this is to produce something that feels natural and organic. No, I don't know. Like just you can put it in whatever game you want. It doesn't matter. Uh, how know they're tagged is arbitrary. For example, anti-religious. What counts as anti-religious? That's a subjective thing. Racist. What counts as racist? That's also a subjective thing. Um, we also had strengths to that. This is a minor racist comment. This is a major racist comment. Two different designers could interpret those very differently. So that resulted in a lot of ambiguity between those things. Uh, the values on individual topics were largely arbitrary. So you know, you'd say like, ah, eh, well, this topic comes up about 15 times in the game, so it's eight points per thing. This topic comes up five times, so it's 20 points per instance. <clears throat> that was done for flexibility, but ultimately it was just very difficult for people. If, uh, if we were making uh, a sort of uh, a a turn-based role-playing game about my streams uh, and we had this system in it, you would find that horniness <laughs> of any kind, you'd have to give them the sort of value of one because it comes up way too often. <laughs> An organic system is hard to test. That's part of the point, is that if you take a different route to the game, you can arrive at that relationship through a different uh, way. And what feels good is ultimately subjective. So someone might say, yeah, this feels totally great. And another person might say, this feels completely rushed or fast, or why is it taking so long for this character to react to the choices that I've made? So the reception, not good. This did not go well. Um, there were lots of behaviors that were just way out of whack. Um, Aloth was one of them. Aloth came across as this super critical, like he would just, 
He was constantly frowning and like being mad about almost everything you did. Um, it was because his topics were marked very correctly, but the instances of that were just so frequent that you were just constantly seeing Aloth like fret about everything you did, which was not really the intention. And then the other one that came up is that Shodi and Palagina had these like terrible conflicts. Um, Shodi is a priestess. Palagina hates the gods in all religion. And there were a couple of places where you could like have Shodi in your party, get Palagina, and then go into her hub and be like, tell me about yourself, Palagina. And she's like, well, I hate the gods. Also, I think all priests are stupid morons. They're complete idiots. And like, bing, 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 bing. And so over and over again, Shodi is just like <laughs> going crazy. And then after five minutes of going through Palagina's hub, you could exit and Shodi would immediately explode on this person that she met five minutes ago. That was not intended, but that's how it worked. Uh, so the goal was to be more organic and natural, but these failures felt especially artificial. They felt like really, really bad. So it was the complete opposite of what I wanted. I think this is just a problem with the way it was integrated. The system itself, I think, is genius. And if... Um, I, I wonder if this is... Because he talked earlier about the way they um, broke off the design phases for the companions. I wonder if this had been integrated really carefully at the start, um, that this could have been tuned around a bit better because the problem genuinely just seems to be that it's a bit excessive in places and um, poorly optimized rather than the system itself being particularly bad. Would I do it again? Only if I simplify the system. I do think that there is a cool thing that was going on there, but it was just too complicated for people to use. It's entirely my fault. Um, I did want to try a new system. I think we learned important things from it and it could be valuable in the future if it were tuned much better. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ultimately, yeah. I feel like sometimes you have to go too far to know where the limit is. I found it. <laughs> Now we're going to talk about ship-to-ship -ship combat. For all of these Pillars of Eternity videos, that I, all of these Pillars of Eternity streams that I've been doing, this little chat section that he just had there about this specific system, this is what I've been looking for in all of them. I've been looking for this for such a long time. <laughs> this is very controversial. Um, this is the UI for ship-to-ship -ship combat. So instead of having like a, a thing on the open seas where ships would fight, when two ships encountered each other, you would do this turn-based minigame that was abstracted. You had your ship position relative to the other ship at the bottom. You had oh! This was very abstract. This is very board gamey. Uh, also very disliked by a lot of people. Yeah, okay. I can tell you why people dislike this. Because you're computerizing the interaction systems from the tabletop, and now you're undoing all of that because you're abstracting something when the whole point is that you don't need to abstract it. That's what it being a video game means man People. I thought it was yeah you tried telling me i know and you told me but i had already made the thumbnail i changed it up and i wasn't going to change it again hey guys let's not turn this into a pirate game and that is exactly what became so it's a sh it's a ship mini game where you maneuver around and blast each other um it seems very logical i have a ship there are other ships sailing around i should be able to shoot cannons at them okay i guess that makes sense uh it's a cool idea maybe for some people if you like this style of presentation a lot of people really did not Okay, so there's actually a really easy solution for that, which is just that um, if you do a mission, if you do a quest for like, I don't know, the king of Flim Flambra block, which is like a shipping magnet or like something like that in the middle of the ocean, um, you can get a specific banner. And if you raise the banner with your flag at the top of your ship, you are completely neutral in all affairs. The pirates won't attack you. None of the other navies will attack you. It's just like you have a charter that allows you to sail freely amongst all the factions. And that's a quest that exists specifically if you just don't want to deal with the headache of ship-to-ship -ship combat. But if you do want to interact with that system, then um, maybe you can, ha you can just not fly that banner. So how do we implement this? It really is a full game within a game. Like you could have, we could have had like a whole indie dev studio just make this game. It seems very simple, but there is like so much stuff going on in it. It's a ton of stuff. It yeah, uh, you could have an indie studio like uh, Ubisoft working on this game, call it Skull and Bones, and <laughs> announce it. What ten years ago? I think it was like 2016 or whenever they announced it, uh, and maybe 2018. Uh, and it's still not out, and it's never coming out because that game is dead. It's in development hell, and it's also not an interesting enough idea to continue working on. Uh, Black Flag was a fun novelty. You should have done another Black Flag right away. That was the time. Now is not the time to release another Black Flag. Not a very fun game for a lot of people, but a game. Um, also, we had like Sea of Thieves and stuff, so it's like, you know, you've, you've, you've missed it. Of to get you missed the timing. Feedback was very negative on the team. Good job, Ubisoft. There were a couple people that did. Yeah, Actually, idiots. Had promised. Um, even more resources went into the first iteration on it, and the feedback was still extremely. I somehow doubt it's still in development hell. Um, 
No, I mean, I only ever hear about the game when we when they announce that, well, the creative lead is leading and they're undoing three years of work and like stuff like that. But it's been a while since I heard about it. So maybe it's maybe somebody managed to write that ship <laughs> in development away, heaven. It gets, gets Did it so come out? Maybe is that the joke you guys are making? I don't know. And disappearing and then you just keep sending more people into the pit and nothing's getting better. That's quicksand. Um, it's a quicksand feature. And so I cut it and my boss brought it back as a crowdfunding goal. Ooh. This is where throwing people under the bus happens. Um, <laughs> I said, hey man, I think this is going to be really expensive and really difficult, and I don't think a lot of people are going to like it. Um, but he brought it back as a crowdfunding goal, and so we were going to do it. Um, it was the most expensive feature in Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire in terms of dev time and money spent. Uh, it was a drain on every department, especially testing, but every, every other department had to contribute to it. Uh, it never oh, it's dead. Oh, the thing is that yeah. The really is liked it? it. Like Did they cancel it, or is this just um, speculation? They hate the whole system. They hate the presentation. They just, they just hated the whole thing. Um, quicksand. Yeah, it just it always seemed to need more stuff. So the reception to this was technically mixed because again, there were people that really did like it. Um, Here it is. So you're really trying to not shit talk his boss. Uh, um, yeah, but like when you work on a big creative project with people like this, just tensions get heated, and you can like you can love the people and have very emotional disagreements with them about stuff like this. Where like. Like you're saying, you know, this took up most of the time and most of the money and everybody hated it and nobody, I didn't want to do it and I was kind of forced into doing it and it sank a lot of the potential of the game because imagine if the time that went into this had gone into other aspects of the game that maybe needed those resources more. Um, but like, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. What do you know? What do we know? What do we know? Hated it. Speculation. Uh, okay. The okay. In the game. Um, it was a very abstract system with limited. Uh, Sawyer was also against voice dialogue. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He wa he was, but he was also like he felt compelled, like he needed to do it because uh, Divinity Original Sin Two had done it. Would I do it again? No way. Like again, it's not that I don't think that I don't. It's not that I personally don't think it's fun. It's just that for something that most players will have to engage with, knowing that many of the people playing the game were never going to like it, I would not do it again. Because ultimately, this is the fantasy we needed to deliver on, which was deck-to-deck -deck combat. We already had that. Remember this? This is what we showed players you'd be doing. You'd be shooting people in the face at point-blank range. <laughs> like, I did really want to get tentacles attacking your ship. I never got that, so sorry about that. But ultimately, fighting on the deck of the ship, this, that's what we essentially showed the player that we were going to do, and that's what we needed to do. The ship-to-ship -ship stuff, I think, just wound up being a lot of time. Yeah. Full voiceover. All right, I'm rushing through these guys. Uh, so as I said before, Divinity Original Sin 2 set a new standard. We had a lot of internal... More like his boss felt compelled. Ooh, Fer is that... Uh, that's Fergus Urquhart, I believe. People really throwing <laughs> Fergus Urquhart under the bus here, huh? I don't get the love for Divinity Original Sin 2. To me, it seems like an unfocused mess. Debate about full DO. Ooh, ooh. I thought it was too late um, because it was halfway through development and we did not start off thinking that we were going to be able to uh, that we were going to do full DO. We were going to do oh full my DO. god. Okay, so yeah, no. <laughs> uh, guys, I'm beginning to I, I you know I think I know what may what may have sunk this game. <laughs> Yeah, this seems like a case of really bad management. <laughs> I was the only person really on that team that had previous experience working on a game of full VO, which was Fallout New Vegas, and that was 65,000 lines of dialogue, and it was a ton of work. Uh, so what I said is, let's do full VO in the early game and not do side characters in the later game. Let's, like, you know, sort of hedge our bets and just and manage that. Um, I was overruled at the owner levels. Owners believed that we really, really, really needed full VO. Oh, no. So we did, uh, full VO implementation. Critical Role came out to do the major character voices, which was very, very cool. Um... When we had to do prep, that was with two production milestones left. So people were going, hey, why aren't the writers... Obsidian is famous for bad management. Yeah. Um, and that takes all of their time for a game that has, again, tens of thousands of lines of dialogue. Uh, we were recording across three time zones, including 2 a.m. Oof. Time, very yeah. Um, I'm just... I had completely forgotten this part of the... Uh, of the convention um, talk that he did. I'd completely forgotten this section. I'm I just... This is a eulogy right now. <laughs> If people missed sessions, this is savage. Or, um, <laughs> he sure is an average of city and Initially, the owners would. It's why Avalon burned bridges and said he'd never work with them again. Ooh. Not move the schedule. I will go on record here as saying this was the most intense personal pressure I've ever had on a project, and that includes shipping Fallout in Vegas. I told you this was the good talk. So I'm sorry, I didn't listen. <laughs> uh, fatiguing and draining. Um, took me to the breaking point. This was very, very difficult to get through. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe, ch chat, since we're running out of good GDC talks, 
maybe we should just do like topic talks together where it's I spend maybe an hour or something assembling like a topic that's fun. It's like imagining Elder Scrolls 2. Uh, and I just have like some bullet points and we discuss some of these ideas together in stream. Would that be interesting? Is that something people would like? Um, you can do VO without killing the budget. You don't need to hire people that cost an arm and a leg. Yeah, but like it's like he's talking about there where the writers are directing the actors. So that's time spent not writing the script. And also you're just adding another layer of complexity to scheduling and logistics. Like, yeah, obviously you can do it, but it is just objectively speaking easier to not do it. Uh, and especially when you're introducing it halfway through development. Like, look at this. Recording across three time zones with 2 a.m. sessions. You don't get good stuff this way. This is not, this is, no, this is not the way. Um, and, like, doing pickups and stuff like this. This is, yeah, this is, this is not great. Uh, good night, ADAC. We did get the extra time and we got through it. Um, how did it go over? Uh, it went over very well. People loved it. Streamers, reviewers, players. We can do that while you stream uh, Gothic. Huge um, <laughs> what a good joke. <laughs> Elder Scrolls 2. Elden Ring 2. Elden Ring 2. Even knowing how much Fulvio added to the game, knowing that we were not going to get the extra time initially, I would never do that. That's what I meant. extremely demoralizing for the narrative team, um, and it put everyone under a huge amount of stress. I would, I would still... I want to sleep, but still more... Vorge. Advocate the same part Work. Oh, With even... Time? Yes, because now Look, it's an expectation. we have 10 minutes left. Much, that's what it is. Oh my god, my time's up. Uh, Post-launch, the DLCs. Um, Seeker Slayer, Survivor, Beast of Winter, and Forgotten Sanctum. Uh, I think the DLC teams did a really fantastic job. These games are much more focused than the original game. Um, awesome teamwork. They did awesome Many such cases. Online. By the way, uh, Ashes of Ariandel might be the best piece of Dark Souls content we ever got. I'm just going to drop that here. Like I'm going to drop that here an hour, 40 minutes into this stream, and I'm never going to bring it up again. It's just going to be a hidden little gem for people to discover if they ever watch this. Okay. Everybody here, you have to keep it secret. Uh, can't can't there be sharing game. this. Um, there was internal debate about doing a big expansion versus three DLCs. Owners wanted to do three DLCs, so that's what we did, or rather what the expansion team did. Uh, it was better than doing the split expansion, like on the first game, uh, but it was still very stressful. Doing three DLCs on a tight schedule is very hard. Uh, lots of overhead for every single launch, because if you do three DLCs in a row, you're essentially launching three products, and then you're supporting each one of them as you go on. All right, in the long term, Difficulty. We made lots of balance changes over months and months and months of time. We also tuned almost every quick path and major side area in the game encounters. That's work that should have been done early on. Um, we added god challenges. These are optional gameplay modes that made the game more difficult. For example, Mogren's challenge made it so that you uh, had limited time to pause the game. And in turn-based mode, which we added later, your turns would actually run out and just skip. Um, the Bareth god challenge, any character knocked out for more than 10 seconds would die. So <gasps> pretty significant gameplay challenges. We added 11 overall and then an ultimate that wrapped it up. That was very cool. We continued iterating on the ship UI. Um, we did actually include narrative changes to explain some of the narrative shortcomings. Um, these were included in the 5.0 patch. I think people have received them very well. Again, it's my fault that it wasn't clear to begin with, but we did try to address it in the long run. And then finally, those sidekicks, those minor companions, uh, they did each get expanded into sort of a mini companion with the DLCs. Again, I have to thank the DLC team for doing great work here. Um, Edwin, Edwin, Constantine, and Vecina each got expanded into a mini companion with their uh, expansions or with their DLCs. The biggest thing that was added post-launch that made the biggest difference overall was turn-based combat. This was the thing that we didn't do from the beginning because the Infinity Engine games are real-time with pause. But about a billion people bought Divinity Original Sin 2, so let's give it a whirl. Um, <laughs> this was not my idea. This was the idea of Nick Carver working with a programmer named Brian McIntosh. I initially resisted it because it did not accurately preserve the action economy of the real-time with pause combat system. The real-time with pause combat system was based on seconds and tenths of seconds, and the turn-based system that they could implement reasonably couldn't sustain that. It had to kind of break the action economy. But I realized that it was an argument of perfect versus good. Um, yes, we could not faithfully adapt the original system, but tons of people who were turned off by the real-time with pause combat would be drawn into the game even with an imperfect implementation, so we did it. By far the most significant implementation or, uh, thing that we added to the game, this was... Don't get me wrong, this was a lot of work, but compared to things like the ship combat system, this was like nothing. Like, this was a very sort of straightforward implementation. There were lots of bugs to work out, but the reception to it was almost universally positive. It was a great thing for us to add. And we added it, you know, nine months or so after the game launched, um, and it, hmm. people responded very well to it. Interesting, right. interesting. We actually made it through. So some lessons learned here. Uh, we made some assumptions about real-time with pause and turn-based combat that maybe don't apply anymore. Um, it's not the late 90s, early, early, early 2000s. Um, Sadly. I know somebody's going to read this and say, oh my god, Obsidian's never going to make a real-time with pause game again. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that I've always Sadly. said like turn-based games. I think we're now finding other audiences that also really appreciate them. I think the fact that our turn-based... How well did Pillars of Eternity games in the end do? Uh, well, when was the last time you played a Pillars of Eternity game? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I... I... It didn't, I didn't, I don't think it sold a lot. I don't think it like broke the budget or anything. Like, I don't think this was like an amazingly successful game, but 
I think the s- sort of silver lining with Deathfire is that I don't think Pillars of Eternity is a ruined license. I don't think people walked away from this thinking that Pillars of Eternity is dead. This is there's nothing more to be mined from this. I think this can totally be turned around. I think if you do a third game and you do it really well, you can completely salvage the Pillars of Eternity license. That we don't we don't have to just con- constrain the Pillar series to doing real time pause combat in the future. Don't make any assumptions about that. But it's just to say that turn based is. A totally viable but if you're gonna do that, I would encourage them to look at a new creative team. Um, because I think the, like, Josh Sawyer and the team that they had may be not the best people to sort of gauge the best practices for this. Uh, and also, good management from the get-go. Don't, do not start adding shit in the middle of development, like, voice acting, what are you doing? Easier difficulties are very important, but hardcore RPG players, they really need it. Acer, stop hopping the Kofium. Even the devs don't know what to do with the license anymore. <laughs> hey, maybe they should give this license to Bethesda. You know what? I think Bethesda could do a lot of interesting things with the Pillars of Eternity license. <laughs> it's going to be really, really disappointing. I'm not saying to make the game incredibly difficult for everybody, but if you neglect the difficulty too much, as I did... Encourage um, them to ask me. <laughs> No, I don't want to work on Pillars of Eternity. You just, you just see resource after resource going to them. Try to cut them as soon as possible. Fight like hell to get rid of them. Because they're quicksand. They will just consume resources until the game launches. And ultimately, if they don't really work well... Design, <laughs> Obsidian not- good management. That's um, even more BS yeah, than saying it's not dead. It's also because of us. We contributed to it. I actually saw reviews of um, Alcat's Pathfinder Kingmaker. Yeah, but like of- when I say give, give Pillars of Eternity to Bethesda... There's a, there's a lot of good things Bethesda could do to it. Imagine you're in Pillars of Eternity, but you can, like, pick up a spoon and you can rotate it in your hand. And then you see a guy and you, you, you attack him with your sword, but he doesn't die. And you're like, oh my god, he must be an important quest character. I'm gonna, I'm gonna treat this encounter seriously. And then you play through the entire story and it's like a 30-hour narrative about you standing still while characters bark dialogue at you. And you realize that this guy that you couldn't kill... He never shows up again. <laughs> you mean about? I do mean about. <laughs> I don't want to work in Pillars of Eternity. Who does? I don't know. Get somebody to do it. Like, get um, get somebody to do. I don't know. Get f- somebody. Somebody must want to make it. You could pick up a roll and put it on a plate. It's magic. That's true. You could put a, put a bucket. You could pick up a bucket and put it on somebody's head, and it would be like insane. It's incredible. And it's, it's it's kind of a ridiculous expectation, but now it has become this expectation where players just think that everything will have full deal. I think most of these RPG games, games would be a lot more fun early game if you got to start at level three instead of one. It takes oh, yeah. so much time. You have to lock your dialogue so much farther in advance than you're expecting to. And I mean, again, I think it was uh, sixty-two thousand lines of dialogue for Deadfire. Like, it's just, it's a logistical nightmare. So if you if you go down that road, just understand that you're going to have to plan a lot for it. And ultimately, again, the plot should have been about one struggle, not two. We had two very cool, neat ideas that didn't really quite converge. Entirely my fault, um, but lesson learned. Also, I should probably direct a different type of game next. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Icewind Dale, Icewind Dale 2, Neverwinter Nights 2, and then Pillars of Eternity 1 and 2. These are all party-based, fantasy, real-time with pause games. Um, I'm a little burned out on them. Dead Fire was, again, the most stressful sort of directing experience I've had so far. And then he uh, he worked on Pentiment, and I believe people were pretty positive on Pentiment, right? So hopefully the next thing or I Penitence. I don't remember what it was called. I still like these games a lot, but I need some time and perspective to come back to them. You can't put things on plates in real life, Acer. No, but I can do it in a video game. You can burn out. You can't I don't know what point you're trying to make here. And then you're not really doing good work because you're just burned out. The series isn't dead. You should fire everyone working on it <laughs> and replace them. No, I wouldn't work on it if given the chance. <laughs> Acer, let the series you don't even care about go. <laughs> but listen, listen, listen. This can be salvaged. <laughs> uh, Thank you very much. Is there a Q&A here? It doesn't seem like it. Oh, one or two, if it's there is, there is, there is. Is there a question Hello. time bombs? Thanks for the great lecture. Thank you.
Uh, I was wondering because I it's always a German. Have you noticed that whenever we do one of these god dang uh, convention talk videos, when it comes to question and answer, it's always some guy that's like, yes, hello. So I was wondering what you would do if you were working on this game today. Would you do it differently? It's like, god dang it. These, these damn Germans are hogging up all of the convention questions. A year ago, I was also working on an RPG game. It was a big game. And uh, I was wondering how many times have you actually played the game from beginning to the end, like in one, one save file? <laughs> because I actually never did it. So I think it's important, personally, because I'm director and often lead designer, uh, I always try to play through the game at least once from beginning to end. Every game at least they're not the Italian or French. I think it's very important to get that experience. On Deadfire, I had one full playthrough. German efficiency <laughs> dominates Q&A. So, um, one of the problems is that Deadfire is an enormous game. There's also some I just think that Germany might be a specifically, like, and I, I, I think the German people watching this will understand what I mean, but Germany is a, is a, is a uniquely autistic country. And that's just a really solid demographic for attending these sorts of uh, conventions, you know? <laughs> All right. Uh, so I gave this a very fancy title: "Breaking the Mold." What the hell? Evolution and paradigm shifts in Pillars of Eternity. Two. Played the game from beginning to the end, like in one to one the end. Pilot, because I actually never did it. So I think it's important personally because I'm. Don't talk shit about Germany. We don't want round three. Designer, <laughs> uh, I always try to play through the game at least once from beginning to end. Every game that I've worked on in a significant capacity, I've always worked on. I've always played through the whole game with one character the whole way through. I think it's very important to get that experience. On Deadfire, I had one full playthrough and three half playthroughs. I think total. So. Um, one of the problems is that Deadfire is an enormous game. There's also some debate, I think, which is a separate topic. Um, should directors design content? Or should they Was that artistic or autistic? I... I mean... Okay, this is another hot take. I think that... Um, you can sort of... The, the, spl the dividing line between these two is Bismarck. Prior to Bismarck, artistic... After Bismarck, autistic. When it's just a bunch of different city-states, uh, when it's like Bavaria and Prussia and stuff like that, artistic. But when German uh, unification has happened and you get like Germany as it exists, it's like, you know, get Deutschland, autistic. I want to work on the game. <laughs> like, Not artistic. Remember that one so, guy. Like, oh, yeah, it reminds me of that guy. <laughs> I'm to write the system design. I was the co-narrative lead with Terry Patel, but I also then played the game and gave feedback. Um, it's a difficult balancing act, but um, I think if a person has responsibilities on the game, it's very difficult unless the team leadership makes time to play the game. Um, so the very impressive uh, were in city states. I know, I know, but I, I meant the thing that they were. And they're enormously valuable for city states is just the thing that word that came into my head. It's like no provinces, so, countries. But the thing is, people can't, I mean, they can make time on their own, but that's a lot to ask of people. Usually what we try to do is schedule time for people to play through the game so they get more exposure to it. It ultimately makes the game better in the long run. Okay, I think we have to... And here, so All right. no, to prepare for the next speaker, right? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I think we need to uh, stop it. Okay, also, it's in Poland, uh, this <laughs> this showcase. So, you know, what what was this German guy doing in Poland? Hmm. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so yeah, that was uh, Pillars of Eternity Deathfire. Um, finally watched the one we'd been meaning to watch for such a long dang time. Duh, now I can also uh, duh, 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 remove it from the folder here. Breaking the mold, more like removing this from the folder. Video games? Video games indeed. Video games, video games. Uh, thanks everybody for watching. Uh, this was a pretty long one. Uh, I'm gonna go maybe get a hot dog. If you joined the Discord server, don't be surprised in a couple of minutes if you see some photos of hot dogs. Bye!